Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Satyajit Rath, and we are going to discuss some of the issues that have been coming up regarding the vaccines. Satyajit, the one issue that has come up regarding the vaccines is that it's private sector uh, driven. The bars are lower than what it could be, and that we have no independent verification of the success or otherwise of the vaccine before they are pushed into large scale use. So how would you react to this kind of criticisms? And uh, do you think that we could have done better? So absolutely, we've, we've discussed some aspects of these issues uh, in some of our previous conversations. Let me just reiterate a few of the crucial points of worry about vaccines. And let me give reference to very recent happenings. Firstly, we've been pointing out that the US FDA has said that 50% protective efficacy will be sort of acceptable for licensing a vaccine. Now we are told that the European regulatory authority might accept an even weaker threshold. Okay. Um, the, the weaker threshold that they're talking about? They haven't come up with a, with a number, but they've given some indication that they might, cover, they might be satisfied with an even weaker threshold. This makes two points. Not the point that this is unacceptably low. There is no such thing as an unacceptably low protective bar with a first generation vaccine. Most first generation vaccines will show modest efficacy and they'll improve over time. So that's not the problem. The problem is, firstly, that everybody seems to be doing a different threshold. This is going to get messier and messier. Okay. And everybody is doing their own vaccine trial in their own way. Okay. So let me give you the example again of all the huge numbers of claims we've had for treatments. And what came out last week as the result from the solidarity trial, which is coordinated by the WHO, that said much of antiviral uh, medication does not really help a lot in severe illness. So a reasonable question from the public commons point of view is, why isn't there a common vaccine trial platform coordinated by the WHO in which all vaccine candidates can be plugged in, where transparency, uniformity, and related issues will all be dealt with appropriately. So effectively, if everybody tests their own thing in their own way, the criteria is not common. What is efficacy and how efficacious each of them are? And I'll ask, ask a, a layman's question here. We are getting two kinds of, again, noise or informed criticism. We are not sure which. One of which which says that vaccine should be such that people should not get infected at all. And that should be the really the criteria. Other criteria is, well, even if they get, do get infected, that they don't show any severe symptoms. So obviously, there is still protective action. And therefore, reducing the level of infection, so to say, is also a valid target. So how do you evaluate such claims? So that's a, that's a great point, because it's a point of concern currently. Here's the difficulty. We have a whole spectrum starting from very mild infections to very severe infections. But what we mean by mild and severe has two separate axes, if you like. One is the amount of virus. The other is the amount of symptom and sign of, of illness in the body. These are not, while they are correlated, these are not necessarily identical at all. For instance, you can have a very severe reaction of your own body to the infection, but not have a very severe viral load at that point. Precisely. In fact, we've discussed this in past months, where we've pointed out that the severity of illness is almost entirely due to the body's response to virus. So there's always likely to be some gap between how much virus and how much bodily response. So we do want the vaccine primarily against disease. We do not say a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. We say a vaccine against COVID-19. Okay. We want a vaccine against the disease because it's the disease and its mortality 
or otherwise severe illness and related issues that we are most worried about. That's a very valid point. Let me sort of reiterate that or ask you to sort of elaborate that a bit. That the difference between SARS virus not being a SARS-CoV-2 but against the disease means that even if you have reproduction of the virus in your body and you are able to fight it off and not show symptoms, that means that's okay because that didn't really uh, cause an illness. But when you show symptoms, then you are saying that there is a quote-unquote uh, COVID-19 disease. Is that Correct. the difference? So, absolutely, yes. But there is yet another twist to that story, which is we have an individual perspective and we have a community perspective. Okay. At the individual level, we want what you pointed out. We do not want to be severely sick so long as I'm not particularly sick. So long as I don't even really notice that I'm infected, I don't care whether I'm infected or not Okay. okay. at the individual level. But at the community level, I am because even if I'm transmitting for just a little while, that's significant in terms of the dynamics of spread of disease. So in both ways, vaccines matter. These two are not necessarily identical. Okay. And it's completely confusing at this point what the vaccines are being tested for and what they're not being tested. So the and success criteria the not problem. being common means comparing vaccines or understanding what they're expected to do is also then confused at least for lay people like us. So at the moment, I think that the bulk of the design of the vaccine simply says, is any illness caused by the vaccine, protected against by the vaccine? Okay. So asymptomatic infections none of the vaccine trials, as far as I can see, even look for. Okay, okay. So they are not designed to look for prevention of transmission. Okay. On the other hand, they are not even designed specifically to look for reduction in severe illness. So they are sort of in neither nor, or, it's not a totally irrational design, but it is a design that is that is geared to give you results in as short a time as possible. So that's where you started from, that if we want a quick vaccine, and we desperately need one at the moment, which can reduce the severity of the disease, cause much less uh, people then to die, all of that is what our primary concern at the moment is. Transmission then will be fine-tuning the vaccine, say, and that's going to take longer. Do I sort of summarize uh, what the intent at the moment is for the vaccine development? Yes, yes. But let me complicate this further for our audience. I apologize, but COVID-19 is complicated. And we need to stop pretending, uh, unlike governments the world over, and particularly in India, that it is not complicated. It is complicated. So here is the difficulty. If our first generation vaccine are mildly protective and mildly inhibiting, uh, preventing transmission, how widely are we going to use them? How long are we going to wait for a second generation vaccine that, that will do better? Who are we going to give the first generation vaccine to? Who are we? You know, these are the sorts of ongoing complexities of public health policy that we need to be openly, seriously, and transparently engaged in discussing. And we don't seem to be. And that is where the big problem in most countries are, particularly in India, where we have an opaque body or bodies which are doing certain set of things. We are hearing from the minister that, yes, we are going to do all of this. We are going to provide 20 to 25 crore people with vaccines in, by June. But we really have no idea what the success criteria is, who are the people, how are they being selected for giving the vaccines, what is the cost of the vaccines, how will the supply chain be built and maintained, except for uh, a small, much smaller number of people for which we have the necessary supply chain, basically from the polio vaccine oral drops. But again, there were oral drops. They were not, for instance, 
injectable. So that exactly. automatically reduces the number quite significantly. So all of this is completely opaque as of now. And we have not got any answers and not has, not has any committee come out and said, this is what you're planning or doing. Yes, but it doesn't surprise me because on, on the one hand, we have a government and related establishment, scientific establishment mechanism that's not telling us any of what you address. On the other hand, it is telling us um, uh, fanciful supermodel stories about how uh, India's national lockdown, uh, which has been described, I suspect, accurately as draconian, has saved some monumental numbers of lives. And this is based on really no good uh, evidence whatsoever. Both of these, I think, are of a piece with governments and establishments simply beginning over these months to use the pandemic to put an uncritical positive spin on their performance rather than dealing uh, substantively with their citizens. And not to say about declaring uh, Bihar vaccine during the elections, but we leave that part out. Uh, coming to what you have raised, and I think that's a very, very important issue, though I really hate to use the supermodel for a model uh, unless we are talking about the ramps. And uh, I suspect those who have produced the supermodel would have been better off doing that than what the mathematics they have presented to us. I I'm going to uh, talk about one particular element of this, that while all public health bodies Experts, three bodies got together and said Indian lockdown had failed. And this is epidemiologists, public health experts who have spent lifetime in all of these issues. They said that Indian lockdown was draconian, but it failed. So we have that statement. And then we have three people. One of them is a control engineer. I would say my brethren, part of my larger brethren group, because I used to be one before I considered myself enough, 30, 40 years of modeling was enough. So a control engineer, a, a computer science person, and a military doctor. These are the three who have got together. As somebody has written, I think is uh, uh, Gautam Menon has written that none of them have anything to do with epidemiology. So at least one of them had something to do with medicine and have produced what is called a super model. Okay. Now, the Criticism of the model is that A, it is uh, the same genre of model, which can be used to say, give a two, three weeks prediction of some kind, but has not succeeded in predicting anything beyond that, mainly because you cannot predict how people interact with each other. And it's not true that this interactions can be modeled the way what uh, our statistician uh, mathematical friends say in these class of models. So they are basically models for predicting what would happen if you don't take action. And B, they're not meant to be for more than one, two week predictions. And I think Gautam Menon is on record on this, who's a computational biologist, who's saying that they have changed parameters six times or eight times during the model. The parameter value, which has changed, is from 65 to something like. Uh, some thousands. So the number, the ratio of the parameter change is something like one to thousand or even larger. So all of this is, if you want, if you can do this, you can predict uh, a squared, but the, the, what is it? A squared plus B squared is equal to C, C squared. And therefore God exists, which is one time mathematical proof that was given for the existence of God. So isn't this uh, pathetic that we have descended to this level of uh, modeling to justify what the government has done? So um, let me let me take this conversation, uh, let me shift this conversation just a little bit. I'm going to leave the criticism of the calculations themselves to people who know something about this. But for me and our for our audience, let me point out the extraordinary nature of this paper that is published in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. Remember what this is. 
this is a paper that models the progression of the epidemic of the COVID-19 epidemic in India. So you expect two components in the methodology. You expect the paper to describe where they took the data from and what the data consisted of. And you expect the paper to say what model was applied in sufficient detail that people can reproduce it. Correct? Right. This is what is expected as the methodology of the paper in any serious scientific paper. Absolutely. Right? Let me read to our you and our audience what the section that says materials and methods consists of. So on this background of what we expect the methodological section of a scientific paper of this sort to contain, let me read the first few lines of the materials and methods section of this paper in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. A consultative committee was constituted by the Department of Science and Technology under the Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, to develop a supermodel consisting of mathematical predictions as related to the COVID-19 pandemic in India. During the deliberations of this committee, there were extensive discussions and literature review of the evolving pandemic and experience from other countries. Several mathematical models submitted to the committee for the spread of a pandemic were analyzed in detail and the gaps identified. I stop here and so on and so forth. This is scientific methodology in a materials and methods section of a scientific paper. Now, secondly, there is no mention of where these data came from in the paper, in the materials and methods section at all. So I have no idea what seriousness the three authors of this paper have put into writing a paper. I don't need to know the mathematics or the modeling in other words, to see that this is an entirely unserious exercise in scientific terms. You know, I am sorry to sound uh, also uh, so dismissive, but the point is, the, if you, as you said, this is a scientific paper, we expect the data and we expect the methodology to be such that if somebody else wants to do it, they should be able to reproduce the results. Now, it, 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 if it is to be, re, if the reproduction means the parameters have to be changed over the period of time, this is what we used to call essentially curve fitting in a way that always the results you wanted is what you got by changing the parameters to suit what results you wanted. The the point here is the sheer blatantness with which a public relations exercise is, is, is being presented. passed off as a, as a scientific effort. I think you put it absolutely correctly that this is at best a, 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 trying to justify whatever the government has done, claim credit where none is visible or at least visible in the way we want to see it. And uh, it's been covered up by the supposed pedigree of the three people who actually are the authors of the paper. It's also interesting, the committee that had other members and some of them have credentials which would actually have epidemiology or other background. None of them are signatories to the paper except the three. So um, let me add to that um, another point of note and that is traditionally in scientific papers the corresponding author is the author with maximal responsibility for the paper for this paper the corresponding author is dr madhuri kanitkar and her address for the purpose of the paper for the purpose of the publication and i read for correspondence, Dr. Madhuri Kanitkar, Deputy Chief Integrated Defense Staff Medical, 
headquarters integrated defense staff ministry of defense government of india new delhi 110011 india email mkanitkar15 at gmail.com in effect especially since there is no disclaimer about the views not being the views of the government of india this is the publicity document of the government of india through the defense ministry <laughs> well i think we have to excuse uh, the defense ministry from what dr kanitkar has done possibly but definitely this is as this is really a public relations exercise for the government masquerading as a scientific paper and i think i think this does not uh, we do not cover ourselves with glory uh, as a, as a nation for building science scientific outlook and so on if the government of india essentially uh, gives cover or encourages such an exercise and the journal of uh, indian journal of uh, medicine what is it called sorry medical research the indian journal of medical research the indian journal of medicine is part of uh, this thing our uh, icmr is it yeah okay and it doesn't yeah. cover itself with glory particularly in the indian journal of medical research which is under icmr publishes such papers and i don't think any serious international journal would have carried such a paper and we have had serious papers for instance based on the serological survey which have been carried by international journals which obviously have shown a certain basic minimum quality for a paper of this kind satyajit thank you for being with us spending this time this really discussing issues which are not easy trying to make it easy for the anchor and the audience uh, for how difficult covid-19 is going to be and how to handle covid-19 vaccines but perhaps is going to be even more difficult this is all the time we have today do keep watching news click and do visit our website Thank <laughs> you.